name is Andy Brady, and I'd like to welcome you uh, tonight to what is the uh, most important lecture, but also the launch of our Smart Cities Conference here at IU. So for those of you who aren't aware of that, tomorrow in the Ostrom Workshop, we will be gathering to talk about Smart Cities. What does that mean? Yeah, good question. That's the first question. <laughs> then we'll begin to talk about, we're going to um, take on a whole bunch of issues. Uh, during the course of the day, and you are more than welcome to come over whatever time you have available if you're interested in that. The agenda is actually on the Ostrom Workshop website. We start around 9 ish. We should be done around 5 ish because the academics and they told us that it's and it will undoubtedly not only be 10 minutes. That's what we do well. Um, so I'd like to welcome you, and now I'm going to introduce uh, Scott Shackelford, who's in charge. Of the cybersecurity program at the Ocean Workshop. Uh, thank you. Hope to see you all tomorrow. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm Scott Shafford. So I'm chair of our cybersecurity risk management program at IU. And for the students in the room, applications are now open for the master's in cybersecurity risk management. I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have. But much more important for our purposes this evening is I'm director of the Ostrom Workshop Program on Cybersecurity and Internet Governance, uh, which is a relatively new program. It itself just launched last year. Uh, so I'll say a few words about that, about the Memorial Lecture, and then introduce our distinguished speaker for the evening. So how many of you, just out of curiosity, are familiar with the Ostroms, with Lynn Ostrom and Vincent Ostrom? Okay, at least half. This is positive. This is good. It's a captive audience. So this is going to sell so much. But still. Um, so as you know, many of you then, uh, the Ostroms were very keen on bringing through the various ways in which governance happens at multiple scales. Okay? So we're using some of the work that they have built up over decades in the fields of institutional analysis, political economy, polycentric governance, and applying it to new areas like cybersecurity and internet governance, right? So as you can tell with our banner, we're pushing the frontiers as much as possible of governance research. And frankly, the, this evening is a great example of how, of how we were doing that. Um, so uh, we're lucky to be joined by Georgia Tech Professor Milton Mueller for our Ocean Memorial Lecture this evening. If you're not familiar, this is a relatively new lecture series as well. It was launched in 2015 to honor the memory of, uh, of Lynn Ocean and Vincent Ocean. Um, and uh, this evening we're going to be focusing on one of these new domains, cyberspace, as you can tell, all the ways in which sovereignty is being tried, tested, uh, not always successfully applied to this new domain. <coughs> Professor Mueller, as a wonderful uh, example to help us do just that, he's an internationally prominent scholar specializing in political economy of information and communication. He's the author of seven books, which I'm sure you read all those in preparation for the evening. I'll be uh, at the end. Lots of good examples. If you haven't read it, do check them out, especially the most recent ones. Well, the Internet Fragment, uh, so that'll come up a bit this evening. Networks and States, the Global Politics of Internet Governance, and Ruling the Roots, um, Internet Governance and the Taming of Cyberspace. Uh, Dr. Mueller's prominence and scholarship is matched by his prominence in policy practice, which is one reason we invited him for the evening, because as you know, those familiar with the Ostroms, they did groundbreaking research, but they also really wanted to have the research be policy relevant. And that's one thing we're trying to further with this series as well. He is co-founder and director of the Internet Governance Project, for example, which is a policy analysis center for global internet governance. Uh, since 2004, when it was founded, it's played a prominent role in shaping global internet governance policies, including at really important forums like ICANN. This is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. If you haven't heard of it so far, you'll know plenty about it um, by the end of the evening. Uh, Dr. Mueller has also been a practical institution builder in the scholarly world. He's created, uh, for example, the Global Internet Governance Academic Network, or GigaNet. Uh, which is a fantastic network of internet governance scholars around the world. And this evening, Professor Mueller will be discussing his project, Sovereignty in Cyberspace, Institutions, and Internet Governance. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Mueller, our OSHA Memorial Lecturer. Thank you, Thank so you Scott. This yeah. All right. Yes, after an introduction like that, I feel like it can only be downhill. <laughs> <laughs> We're done, right? No. 
So it, it really was a, a, a unique treat for me to be invited to give the Ostrom Memorial Lecture because I have been a fan of the, uh, particularly Eleanor's Ostrom's work. I haven't, uh, wasn't that familiar with uh, Vince's, but um, I understand that they were uh, very um, co-evolutionary in their thinking. And uh, um, so, and, and for me, uh, Ostrom uh, served a very practical purpose that was uh, helping me solve the problems that I was confronting uh, somebody with no appropriate theoretical background and just kind of finding my way through some uh, unique and interesting problems. And, uh, and then one day in a used bookstore, I, I think I've told my colleagues about this, I, I have this theory that a certain time I go into a, a used bookstore, there's a book that's calling me, and I come out with a, 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 some kind of a life-changing book. So in this case, it was Governing the Commons. I think I picked it up in 1992 or something like that, and uh, it was really uh, an, an eye-opener. So let's get right into the subject of sovereignty and the internet. In fact, we've been debating uh, this relationship uh, from the beginning. Uh, we went from the internet is sovereign, uh, John Perry Barlow, Johnson and Post, uh, and the internet is exceptional, to uh, what we're at now, which is, uh, oh, it's not exceptional, it's got the same old problems, and uh, we have to figure out how to renationalize it and subordinate it to state power. In fact, the battle uh, over multi-stakeholder internet governance, how many of you have heard that term, multi-stakeholder, right? Uh, versus multilateral or intergovernmental, that is really about sovereignty, as I hope to explain uh, in more detail later. And unrecognized in this battle is a tremendous relevance of Ostrom's work about institutions and institutionalization, because internet governance is now and always has been about institutional innovation in the face of new technology. So, Several people have asked me how I got to being interested in internet governance, um, and I'll explain. I got involved in the 1980s. Um, as computers were just popularizing and computer technology was in the process of transforming uh, the telecommunications infrastructure. It was also transforming the industry and law and regulation. Uh, though I didn't have the vocabulary or the theory yet, uh, what really interested me was the relationship between information communication technology, institutions, and institutional change. I was fascinated in particular by some of the new resource domains that were created in telecommunications. In particular, I got my start looking at uh, radio frequency spectrum and whether you could define ownership rights in it and what, were, what consisted of property rights and could you trade them or how could you have a, a market or did you need central planning? Uh, these are the kinds of issues that uh, were, was fascinating to me. And there was also this global process by which competitive markets were replacing national monopolies, and, and these national monopolies were very old and venerable institutions. The post-telephone and telegraph monopoly uh, was something that went back centuries. Uh, so clearly something very significant was going on. However, and I hope um, my colleagues from the telecom department don't uh, feel offended by this. By, by about 1995, I had become kind of uh, bored with telecom policy. Um, and uh, the reason was that the main institutional changes had taken place. It was like uh, the, the interesting stuff was kind of over, right? We broke up the phone company. That was fun. Loved that. Um, we, uh, we introduced competition in many places. Uh, most of the world's developed economies were following suit. They were also introducing competition, privatizing, liberalizing. Uh, spectrum markets went from being an idea that was literally dismissed as crazy in the 80s to an idea that was routinely generating billions of dollars a year in formally sanctioned uh, governmental auctions. We had an entirely new telecom law in the United States, the first one since 1934. And we had new free trade agreements in information technology and in basic telecommunication services that had spread this whole uh, institutional process um, worldwide. Little did we know that telecom liberalization was just the first step, and it was paving the way 
for another even more transformative change. That change, of course, was the internet, or to be more accurate, internet working. Now, the techno-economic characteristics of the internet were radically different from telecommunications. Entirely new common pool resources, resource spaces, such as domain names and internet protocol addresses, were developing. Uh, new cooperative and market relationships were forming around things like uh, routing, routing of packets, and ISP peering and interconnection. Now, what was most interesting to me, at least, was instead of reforming and going through national regulatory processes in which we were reforming old laws to adapt incrementally to new technologies, we were generating new institutions. New bottom-up governance mechanisms were forming around this new transnational community. Mainstream telecom economists actually weren't much help in this process. Uh, they didn't understand the economics underlying internet resources and connectivity very well. And mainstream political scientists and international relations scholars had their eyes glued on traditional state actors and multilateral regimes and were basically completely ignorant of these organically evolved internet institutions. So you can imagine what a revelation uh, the discovery of Ostrom's work was in this context. So around 1994 to 1998, as the internet uh, transitioned from a closed and small academic network into a major economically significant global medium, we were confronted with the need for institutional development on a global scale. Now, what was it about internet governance that was so problematic and in some ways still is? The ramifications of the question are very complicated, but in some ways the answer is quite simple, and that is what I call the problem of misalignment, the mismatch between the transnational space for societal interaction created by the internet and the territorial boundaries of the world's main governance institution, which is the, the nation state. The internet joins the world of governance into a single space, or at least it has the potential to do so, and was doing so in the 90s. Sovereignty fragments it into 200 pieces. So as the internet developed and became used by billions of people and deeply embedded in our society, all kinds of novel conflicts and disputes arose that required rules, order, governance. Some of these problems could be addressed by existing national institutions and were. All kinds of interesting legal precedents were being set. But many of these problems just didn't fit into that framework. And so we did get new institutions. And let's take a quick tour of some of the institutional innovations uh, the internet has led to. I know how well you can read this timeline, uh, but you can see uh, the very first institution there, uh, which really started out as kind of a, an informal committee of uh, computer scientists in a room, is the Internet Engineering Task Force. And uh, they gradually, literally, created their own rules from the, from the bottom up. They just defined themselves as a new kind of an organization, which was open source. They were developing open source standards. Uh, they were based on individual participation, not on some kind of category. Are you a corporation? Are you a corporate representative? Are you a government? Uh, no, you were an individual. And it was supposed to be about the ideas you had and what those ideas could contribute to the standardization process, not uh, your status as some kind of a an, an corporate entity. And then there was um, IP addresses. So these were internet resources. They had to have unique, globally unique numbers assigned to different users so that you could uh, make these addresses work. And you start getting uh, what we call now regional internet registries in the early 1990s. Uh, and they, too, were uh, still transnational. Unlike the IETF, which was global, uh, the RIRs were regional, but still not based on any kind of a nation state model. And their governance was 
uh, based on contract when they finally formalized. It was based on private contracts, and they were um, uh, eventually incorporated as uh, private nonprofits. Again, not a state actor. Then you get to the domain name system, and you had the problem of the DNS root, which is what I wrote my first uh, serious book about, or my second serious book, I should say. <laughs> um, and uh, this was this very interesting common pool resource that was suddenly commercialized, almost unexpectedly commercialized, and people were appropriating from it, and uh, there was some uh, really overwhelmed computer scientist uh, trying to coordinate this, and we were prevented with, uh, confronted with a very serious problem of where do we go with this, how do we institutionalize this authority to decide what goes into the root and what becomes a, a, a top-level domain. And there was also a BGP routing. So this is actually one of the most interesting aspects of the internet that people know very little about, and that is how do packets get, how do they know how to get from me and my computer to your computer? There is no global central authority that says, here's how it's going to do. There's no ma bell of the internet that absolutely controls internet routing. It's a very uh, decentralized and distributed process. Of course, the standard that governs it is uh, unified and singular, coming from the IETF. <clears throat> but the process of routing is really uh, a form of networked governance in, in the very literal sense. And there will be a quiz at the end, right, with all these acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, <clears throat> I'm defying his instructions to spell out all acronyms. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <clears throat> so these governance institutions literally formed outside of the national legal and regulatory regimes. Um, they were transnational. They were rooted in private actors. Now, it's common to characterize this as the multi-stakeholder model. But I'll ask you to forget about that rhetoric. I could tell you a story about where that rhetoric came from and why uh, it was adopted, but I don't have time for that. The key feature is not the presence of multiple stakeholders. I mean, come on. There's multiple stakeholders in governmental processes. There's public hearings. There's uh, voters and so on. What's unique about these institutions is the supremacy of the non-state actor. It's the way the problem of global governance was solved by transcending national governance mechanisms through transnational communities of, of non-state actors. Now, all of these areas <clears throat> are areas of internet governance where compatibility and connectivity are the prime directive. And that means there's a Nash equilibrium on cooperation. <clears throat> like driving on the right side of the street, you either do that or you have seriously bad consequences, right? More difficult areas of internet governance soon arose which do not so easily equilibrate. These are the areas where articulation with territorial states has become unavoidable. So here I'm talking about content regulation, cybercrime, where you have issues of putting people in jail, um, or at least catching them and prosecuting them. Privacy and data protection, cybersecurity, and particularly with this latter part, the cybersecurity, uh, it's no longer just about the security of the internet user, unfortunately, the security of internet resources, it has intersected with national security and with the military power of the state. <clears throat> so these areas in which uh, the state is reinvoked, which cannot be easily equilibrating on a coordinated global mechanism or institutional mechanism, uh, has created what I call the pressures to alignment. By alignment, I mean the attempt to fit internet governance into the boundaries, back into the territories of the nation state. Let me just briefly describe, I could go on about this for hours, uh, the things that are happening with respect to alignment. 
Probably you're most familiar with the whole idea of uh, bordering content, of uh, introducing filters and censorship and blocking at the national level, which is typically enforced through some kind of control over the telecommunications infrastructure. Um, and the, the Great Firewall of China being the, one of the key examples of that, although I would remind you that a lot of the censorship in China, in fact, most of the censorship is internal rather than external. We sort of um, elevate our importance in China when we put so much emphasis on the Great Firewall, uh, but it's certainly, uh, there's a lot going on internally as well. Another key element of alignment is uh, what's come to be known as data localization. And this is a practice of uh, limiting storage, movement, or processing of data to specific geographies. And it's all about jurisdiction, really. Uh, so Vietnam's Ministry of Public Security has just passed cybersecurity legislation that requires all foreign online service providers to store the data of Vietnamese citizens exclusively in local data centers. Uh, the Brazilian Central Bank has proposed some cybersecurity regulations that prohibit financial institutions from uh, using foreign data processing and cloud computing services. Uh, Belgium, Denmark, Germany, the UK, and Finland are some of the European countries that require companies to store commercial data locally. Uh, in Sweden, companies are required to store information locally to share it with authorities, and that's because the authorities have interpreted a legal requirement to provide immediate access as meaning physical access to servers, so obviously then this, the, the, the data has to be stored locally. Russia has just passed a data localization law. China's national security and cybersecurity laws limit operation of critical internet infrastructure to mainland China, and they impose local data storage requirements on operators and broad restrictions on outgoing data as well. In addition, <clears throat> we have a growing tendency to look at the equipment supply chain with suspicion and talk about national origin. So you may be familiar with the attack on Huawei, a Chinese telecommunications equipment manufacturer in the United States. Uh, essentially, the intelligence community decided that they didn't like the idea that people were buying Chinese infrastructure, and they started saying, uh, this is suspicious, uh, this is uh, dangerous, and they succeeded in driving Huawei completely out of the U.S. market, if not the entire North American market. Uh, you've probably heard about uh, Kaspersky, uh, which is an internet security firm uh, headquartered in Russia. Uh, you used to be able to see them on uh, stores. They sold antivirus software. They're still actually um, somewhat... Uh, boldly advertising in the United States their, their services, uh, but they have been targeted um, by the U.S. government, uh, and uh, there's actually a specific provision in the defense uh, budget that prohibits uh, U.S. government agencies from using Kaspersky software, and there's been some pressure on uh, stores like Best Buy not to carry it. Um, but then, uh, Maybe the NSA's suspicions about this um, stem from their own behavior because uh, among the Snowden revelations, we discovered that there was a program in which the NSA would intercept uh, U.S. equipment that was going to foreign countries, install implants in it that would allow them to monitor uh, the networks uh, that they were sent to uh, and not be detected. And so, um, uh, this, of course, was uh, something that heightened the suspicions. <clears throat> In general, the Snowden revelations were a big boost to the whole idea of alignment or what some people call technological sovereignty. Now, these uh, concerns about cybersecurity are now uh, restricting uh, the flow of investment, the flow of capital. Uh, so we have the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., and the powers of that have just been expanded by new legislation, uh, which has already been used uh, somewhat inexplicably to um, block an acquisition of uh, Qualcomm by a Singaporean firm. Didn't know Singapore was a military threat to the United States, but uh, you never know. 
Um, and um, of course, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, have, have always restricted uh, uh, US investment or any kind of foreign investment, uh, getting a majority ownership share of any kind of an information infrastructure. And finally, we have a growing jurisdictional competition over privacy and data protection laws. Uh, the GDPR is in some ways a good thing because it leveraged the size of the European market to globalize privacy protection. But the problem is, what if the US responds with legislation of its own, which is incompatible with the GDPR, and then we get into a jurisdictional war? And the current head of the NTIA has essentially threatened to do just that. So we have a battle between the global access of the internet and state alignment. And that is the main problem in internet governance right now. Almost everything that's going on can be traced back to that in one way or another. And as I've written in my latest book, uh, this conflict is all about sovereignty, the tensions between sovereignty and cyberspace. So let's talk about the theory of sovereignty. So the principle of state sovereignty is one of the most important concepts underpinning uh, the world's governance institutions. The theory dates back to Bodin in the 16th century. The practice is more recent. Uh, yet one will search the canons of institutionalist th literature for any mention of or discussion of sovereignty. Uh, you can look at Ostrom, you can look at North, Knight, Bates. Uh, they don't mention uh, much less extended discuss uh, the, the idea or the theory of sovereignty. There's some attention paid to the state, to the theory of the state, its origins and its functions. But sovereignty, the institution that regulates the relations among states, is pretty much absent from the discussion. Now, talking about the theory of the state, uh, I don't think anybody did it any better than Weber and his statement that this, the state is a monopoly on the legitimate use of force. Uh, if we look at how sovereignty relates to that, sovereignty sort of bounds that legitimate use of force to a specific territory in order to mitigate uh, uncontrolled uses of violence uh, in the international sphere. As an institution, it's intended to limit and contain the anarchy that exists among states and to regulate the effects of these monopolies on violence by confining them to a designated territory and establishing a reciprocal set of relationships among sovereign units. Uh, so the idea is, OK, we've got these monopolies on violence. They're kind of dangerous. Let's tell them where they have this monopoly and where they don't. And hopefully that will somehow uh, promote world peace. So if Leviathan solves the problem of anarchy domestically, sovereignty is supposed to do the same internationally. It basically assumes that each functioning government is legitimate in its own territory, and then applies these reciprocal rules of non-intervention and voluntary interaction to each sovereign unit. Now, the theory was in the 16th century, the Peace of Westphalia, which incorrectly is ascribed the the beginnings of sovereignty uh, it was 300 years, 350 years ago. But uh, my contention is that you don't really get anything approaching a Westphalian system until the end of World War II, the end of the big European colonial empires and national liberation movements and all of that. But even so, the impact of sovereignty on uh, the international system is limited. Anarchy among states is still a reality. Uh, a careful study of the forms and practices of sovereignty led uh, political scientist Stephen Krasner to conclude that it is best understood as, quote, organized hypocrisy. <laughs> By that, he meant a space somewhere between anarchy and institutionalization, where rulers adhere to the norms and practices of sovereignty when it offers them resources and support, and they deviate it they deviate from it when violating these norms uh, provides them with uh, tangible benefits. <clears throat> so there is a growing trend uh, to think that to deal with the problems of internet governance, we need to turn towards sovereignty. 
this push comes from uh, thinkers at the intellectual level and uh, from the practical policymaker level uh, and from the rational pursuit of their self-interest by states. So I want to explain uh, why sovereignty uh, in cyberspace is not a good idea and why we don't want to go that path. I'm not going to say it's impossible. I am going to say that in order to achieve it, we would have to sacrifice so much of what uh, the internet offers in value that uh, it would uh, not be worth the trade-off. So let's begin uh, my case by making the point that obviously there are domains where sovereignty uh, is recognized to not belong. And uh, the most clearly recognized are the high seas and outer space. The high seas has long been recognized as not subject to sovereign claims. The US government itself has long been a vigorous advocate for freedom of navigation and has re resisted what it views as excessive claims by other states of jurisdiction over international passages or ocean space. So somewhere in there, there's an understanding of the reasons why you might want uh, freedom of navigation or non, a non-sovereign space. Same is true of outer space. The treaty passed in 1967 banned participants from putting nuclear weapons in space. And in Article 2 stated that outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, use, occupation, or any other means. So there are these uh, exceptions or exemptions, if you will, from, from sovereignty that already exist. Now the other point I'll make, or two, two other points, actually three other points about uh, why we don't want to apply sovereignty or why it doesn't work. Uh, number one, let's r recognize the internet protocols as a public good. Um, they are open source, they are non-proprietary, anyone can implement them, and there is an unlimited number of networks that can be assigned unique network numbers in the internet protocols. I say unlimited, um, well, okay, there's a technical standard um, that says um, there are now about 3 billion uh, or 3.7 billion possible network numbers that could be assigned in the internet. And this was completely unique. In the old days, uh, the government would decide how many networks are gonna be, there's gonna be five, there's gonna license six or 10 or maybe one or two. Uh, the internet was just like, you wanna be a network? Okay, here's an autonomous system number, uh, you're a network. Um, run the internet protocols and you're a network. So you have this sort of open invitation to be a network with the internet protocols. Now once you have this, these internet protocols, and this is the hardest part of the argument, uh, create a virtual space that is non-territorial. It's a network of networks. Uh, the, the, the word the internet is actually kind of a misnomer because it's just a protocol for sharing data among independently managed networks. So its boundaries are autonomous systems, not uh, geographic territories. And an autonomous system is not a physical layer phenomenon. It's instantiated uh, at layers three and four uh, as software. Now, of course, physical facilities are necessary to run the software and transmit and store the information. Uh, but as soon as the internet protocols are running on those physical facilities, those physical facilities are part of a non-territorial virtual space through which people can interact really with, without regard to geography. Now, of course, it's also true that we can now detect where you are geographically when you're running these protocols, but that's an application that we are overlaying on this space. It's not necessarily part of the space. So generally, the security problem in cyberspace is not territorial or national. It embraces the entire virtual arena. Data packets can contain threats regardless of where they come from, whether they're inside or outside a country's borders. Packets that come from inside the borders can be generated by agents outside the borders. If they, and if they're able to control domestic computers, um, 
you know, there's remote control going on there. Threats, intrusions, malware can and do come from anywhere in the world. And that's what makes a cybersecurity problem so interesting, right? It's the AS boundary and the security of information assets, not jurisdictional boundaries, that matter. Autonomous systems can avail themselves of firewalls, routing policies, intrusion detection, and authentication to protect themselves. But these defensive technologies are most effectively deployed at the AS level, not at the country level. So it's best to look at the internet as not a collection of national networks, but as a collection of autonomous systems that are woven together by these protocols at the software layer. One more argument about sovereignty in cyberspace. It just struck me the other day, you know, the theory of the state says, you know, it's a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence. So does this make sense in cyberspace? Does anyone have a monopoly on the legitimate use of cyber force? It seems like nobody does. Once you're dealing with global connectivity and instantaneous and invisible action across national boundaries, there's actually no relevant distinction between state actors and non-state actors anymore. Neither one has a monopoly, neither one has legitimacy outside of its own territory. So if, of course, if a cyber attacker and all of her victims happen to be in the territory of a single state, then sure, normal rule of law applies. The aggressor can be identified, arrested, prosecuted. But with transnational actors, and most of the cybersecurity problems we're dealing with are of that type, uh, it's difficult to maintain any distinction between a state actor and a non-state actor. There are attackers and the defenders adversaries and victims, and, and that's pretty much it. So let's assume for a moment that some unknown entity of some unknown type could achieve a monopoly on the use of cyber force that, uh, that was perceived as widely legitimate. How could such a thing be contained in a geographical location? How in a globally compatible cyberspace? I don't think it could be. It would have to be a global monopoly and that would mean a global sovereign, or it would mean our whole notion of territorial sovereignty would pretty much go out the window. Interested to see how the uh, international lawyers react to this argument. <laughs> With a lot of land. <laughs> so if we consider the internet to be a global commons, now I'm gonna tell you the, the, the normal arguments that I hear against this idea. <clears throat> The first is, well, aren't states asserting their control? Aren't they asserting their, their sovereignty? Aren't they going to create it? And uh, the answer is yes and no. States are indeed asserting their power, but states cannot assert sovereignty over or in cyberspace. They can only regulate the way people or things subject to their authority access global cyberspace. And that's an important distinction. It may sound like a weaselly distinction, but it's actually very similar to the situation with ocean governance. It's like, if you're in the territorial waters, uh, we can shoot at you or blow you up or prevent you from entering. We can do all kinds of things. So there's more sovereignty there in the territorial waters than there are out in the rest of the high seas. There's really no national cyberspace over which they're exercising supreme authority. Rather, there's a shared global cyberspace, and they leverage their sovereignty over actors and devices under their authority to restrict connections to certain sites or applications. But this happens in a very imperfect and limited way because they are not in control of who joins the internet outside of their territory. So all kinds of things are happening out there that they have to constantly be monitoring and responding to if they really want to maintain some kind of control over their so-called national cyberspace. The other argument I hear is that, well, the internet is not a commons. Come on, uh, you're paying, what's your least favorite ISP here? Comcast? Uh, <laughs> You're paying them uh, $100 a month to get broadband internet. That's an exclusive service. Where's the commons here? Uh, you're paying uh, Google with your data when you access them. You have to log in. There's no, there's no commons. And of course, um, you know, Ostrom was very aware of the fact that not every commons is, a, is an open access commons. But the, the real nub of the argument here is 
that the Internet's architecture combines commons with private property, and that's what's made it so successful. <clears throat> so the Internet protocols are based on these open, non-proprietary standards and open source software. So the protocols are non-rival in use, and no user can exclude anybody else from implementing them. Most of the facilities and services are interconnected through these protocols are, of course, not a commons. The devices, the autonomous systems, the applications and services are all pretty much private goods. And we get the best of both worlds. We have a commons uh, connecting us together, bringing us together, and we have private goods in which people can market their, their wares. And isn't that the case with all kinds of markets? We have the, you know, the village square, which is a commons, and the people set up their little kiosks and sell things, right? So market and commons uh, always go together. So it's OK to say that cyberspace is a global commons and the internet services and facilities are not most of the time. It's not contradictory in the least. You know, space satellites are physical objects owned by a specific company or country, and the services they provide can be exclusive, uh, exclusive private goods. But outer space is a commons. And the ships are physical objects owned by a particular company or country. Uh, they're under a sovereign jurisdiction, but the sea is a commons. There's no uh, incompatibility here. And I think one of the reasons the, the U.S. was toying with the idea of calling the Internet a global commons uh, around the time of like 2007 to 2010, and then people started making this argument that the Internet is not a commons, and they pulled back from that. Um, so I think it was based on a kind of a conceptual mistake. All right, so now uh, the most difficult question uh, is what difference does it make? <laughs> this is, a, <laughs> I don't know if you know Catherine Lotrianti, the, uh, yeah, this is uh, the argument that we had. It's like, what happens if we abandon uh, notions of sovereignty? Well, what, does anything good happen? Does anything at all happen? And of course, uh, the pragmatic answer to that is, of course, nothing automatically happens. Uh, it's not like the world, you know, the clouds part and, and the, the hymns, you hear this, the music and angels de descend from heaven and the internet is all right again. Um, what I think you get are three possible benefits. Uh, number one is reduced conflict. Number one, you're shifting the criterion for decision making. And number three, you're shifting uh, the decision makers. So in terms of reduced conflict, <clears throat> I think we can all understand how undesirable it would be if the US or any other country asserted sovereignty over outer space or the seas, or if they decided that certain big parts of the ocean were under their sovereignty. Um, those positions could only be maintained via constant military conflict. And indeed, we've seen some dangerous uh, noises coming from first the Bush and now the Trump administration about uh, outer space, which could be leading us in that direction. Um, so rather than searching for justification of their actions through assertions of their absolute authority over distinct pieces of the world or the world itself, uh, a, a commons approach requires states to recognize their coexistence in cyberspace, not only with other states, but more importantly, with business and civil society. Secondly, it shifts the criteria for decision making. So a global commons concept elevates the value of connectivity and compatibility relative to other goals. It says, you know, that's just as important, if not more important, than certain notions of national security and cybersecurity uh, on a, conceived as a national good. It articulates the global internet using public's interest in an interconnected and open space, which is kind of a, an ideal that is getting lost in all the kerfuffle about uh, regulation and control of cyberspace. It infirms the importance of freedom of action and permissionless innovation, <clears throat> all of which fosters economic and technological development, in my opinion. And then, again, it realigns who we think of as the key decision makers. If we're talking sovereignty, then states are elevated to the supreme position. Uh, the non-sovereign approach does not privilege states over private actors. Both are equal status inhabitants and creators of the space. 
when generally applicable cyberspace governance is needed, it must arise through multi-stakeholder cooperation at the global or transnational level. Such an approach strengthens the hand of civil society and private sector actors. At the same time, it does not really interfere with purely domestic regulatory efforts of states. So even if a commons model does not automatically eliminate uh, the political incentives of states to engage in alignment, uh, it helps to contain it and limit its scope. It de deprives it of ideological comfort, if you will. It makes it clear that states cannot and should not have the kind of authority over cyberspace that some of them are seeking. <clears throat> so there's a problem here, uh, a practical problem that, frankly, I haven't thought through completely. So Eleanor Ostrom emphasized the ability of communities to develop self-governing institutions that don't have to be based on the hierarchical authority of an external power like a state. As we have seen, self-governance by a transnational internet community is both possible in some respects already exists because of these organically developed internet institutions. The problem with the self-governance approach in international affairs is that they are dealing with the organized violence of states in ways that appear to touch on their military capabilities. Most of the Ostrom literature on self-governance has assumed <clears throat> that the cooperation and self-governance takes place within a context of civil order. <clears throat> and that kind of assumes an authority with a monopoly on the legitimate use of force somewhere in the background. So whatever governance re regime we settle upon in cyberspace must take state power and the realities of military conflict uh, among states into account. But does this mean that we are doomed to revert to the territorially fragmented governance of a sovereignty-based model? I think not. I think we can find ways to reconcile the two, what I call the problem of articulation, where we delegate some things that are global outside of the territorial states and work them through. But it's not going to be easy. How do we keep state control bounded by territory while at the same time freeing the producers and users of cyberspace to govern themselves? How do we maintain interterritorial peace among states while civil society and business take the lead in cyberspace? Can we use the territorial civil order established by states as a foundation for transnational civil governance of cyberspace in effect, I'm asking, can we demilitarize and denationalize cyberspace? I'll leave you with that question. Thank you very much. Just brilliant. Plenty of food for thought, I think it's fair to say. We only have about 10 or so minutes, but we can start the discussion now and then continue it upstairs. Does anybody have a question to start us off? Yeah, Diane. Um, and I'll do my best to remember the order here. Yeah. Why only two? I think it would, if you're going to go that route, it, yeah. So you do have some kind of uh, polarization around the issue of sovereignty. So Russia and China are the leading powers who are actively promoting the idea of a sovereign sovereignty in cyberspace. And the US, unfortunately, I think is kind of uh, inconsistent and muted in its approach now because they're, the, they're not clear about what they're going for anymore. Um, which, Yes, in, yes, indeed. America first and, um, uh, you know, the whole anti-globalization initiative. So the first thing um, is that the, the threat is not so much a, uh, uh, well, I guess you could say that there's a threat of a digital Cold War evolving in which these two um, uh, sides, um, but, but if you compare that to the real Cold War, when we were you know, shooting and killing each other in third world countries over the, over the same conflict, uh, I think this is a much more manageable problem. And the, as I wrote in my book about Will the Internet Fragment, uh, the, the key thing is that at layer three, the world is completely unified. Right? We are all running internet protocol. The Chinese are running internet pr protocol. The, the Russians are running it. 
If, if you're talking about two different internets, you're talking about a new technical standard. And the network externalities and network effects of creating an incompatibility are so hugely, overwhelmingly powerful that even China and even Russia are not going to stop running internet protocol. So they're going to run it, and they're going to just try to control their national access as much as possible. Uh, and I think, um, at least I hope, that if we you know, demilitarize and uh, denationalize <clears throat> cyberspace as much as possible, that eventually these countries will gradually open up more to, to the internet. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't buy that. But. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't forget who is next. I think Frederica, and then uh, we'll go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Um, I, my question, I guess, has to do with the distinction between ontology and function when we talk about the internet. And from an ontological perspective, perspective I can follow your argument that the internet is a super stable uh, sort of like that tool. But <coughs> in fact, though, when you develop function, like, there are elements of the internet that become a powerful tool in the end of states. And, thinking about the Russian hacking in the American election, like, just simply, the, the sort of decent example of that. So I wonder if sort of there's a way of flipping the argument on its head and reflecting on the degree to which the internet is actually putting pressure on a very definition of the state, where state power is just simply not, no longer territorially based. No, that's, that's a good, uh, that's not at all inconsistent with what I'm saying, because when the states use the internet and, and leverage it for their own political uh, or military ends, they are completely non-territorial. I mean, look at the map <clears throat> of Snowden's, um, uh, you know, he he'd, he'd laid out a map of all of the uh, listening posts and plants that we had uh, in different countries. It was totally global. And, um, and you can do the same thing with certain uh, forms of Chinese implants and so on. And, and when the Russians uh, start uh, using social media in other countries to um, uh, try to influence public opinion, uh, the, the, obviously there's, you know, there are precedents for that. We had Radio Free Europe and they had uh, Russia Today before they were doing that. But uh, you really have globalized it quite a bit. And that's one thing I don't like actually about the US reaction to uh, the Russian penetration of social media is that now we are, again, trying to nationalize the social media and saying, OK, we're going to apply um, restrictions uh, based on what country you're from. Um, OK, it's all right to try to identify uh, artificial bots and so on and make that transparent. But uh, the idea that uh, 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 disinformation, uh, that Russian disinformation is uh, worse than, uh, let's say, um, Trump's uh, disinformation. What what logic is there behind that? So if you're going to if you're going to regulate disinformation, <clears throat> uh, what does the the foreign source of it have to do with anything? So, Mr. Liu, I I, I got to see you over there. What do you can? Yeah, I have a question. Is it very interesting? You said uh, recently, you know, SpaceX uh, sent a, a number of satellites and then provided Wi-Fi signal. Mm -hmm. And do you think this will fundamentally change the internet's poverty in the future a few years? Because say, recently there is some Chinese scholars send a warning to the government, to mm -hmm. the Chinese government, say that uh, information censorship will be eventually not physically possible because of the satellite Wi-Fi. So uh, do you think this will fundamentally change? Yeah, well, as, as optimistic as I am, uh, I think I would not say that the censorship is going to be physically impossible. It will just become more costly. So they will have to do more and more to regulate uh, access to these space-based uh, items. They'll have to control the uh, import of equipment that um, provides access to that. They'll, maybe they'll just have spies running around that uh, you know, grab people that are using these things and uh, arrest them. Uh, I mean, again, they, they can do it. But it, as the costs rise, it becomes more and more difficult. And, and again, that's what I mean about cyberspace. You can, you can assert national control over objects and people under your authority, but because there's all kinds of things going out in global cyberspace that you can't control, there's always this problem of new technologies or new access mechanisms or new applications that, uh, that undermine your control. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for a few more. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I'm thinking of the, like, other kinds of cyber 
it seems like, and then it gets really complicated, because it seems like there are many instances in which you have nations or even states taking actions that actually protect some open element of the internet and or protect like denizens of the internet from the actions of, of these massive platforms. Right? Mm -hmm. I think when you think about like, our rights as individuals and as users of these platforms, mm -hmm. um, it opens up other questions that I'm not sure internet governance as it's currently formulated, um, multi you know, multi-stakeholder uh, wise, uh, mm -hmm. it really sets us up to answer like the, the European GDPR um, is regulation that's that's establishing I think pretty basic fundamental rights for humans uh, and mm -hmm. it's only come out of this uh, you know, uh, well international body mm -hmm. likewise like California just defended net neutrality mm -hmm. in the face of I think abdication of the FCC's responsibility you have other instances like where India uh, strikes out against uh, internet.org which was a, a, a <coughs> Is, is the model of multi-stakeholder governance that emerged in the late 80s and 90s, is that actually serving us in the face of these massive global platforms? Yeah, I think that the, um, if you look at, I mean, I would quibble with, you, you, your big examples are the GDPR, <clears throat> India and internet.org, and net neutrality legislation uh, at the state level. So. I think that um, the problem with uh, net neutrality legislation at the state level is this problem of, of jurisdictional fragmentation. You know, you get different rules uh, for different parts of the internet, and that's uh, that's going to be a problem. Um, now, it's I, I don't disagree that states, in their capacity as territorial authorities, can in fact protect human rights in certain ways. So, yeah, if if somebody's uh, DDoSing you and stopping you from speaking, or if uh, a um, a big platform is stealing your data and leaking it in ways that are harmful, uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with uh, making them liable and, and regulating them to to do that. What what you don't want, however, is um, number one forms of regulation that are extremely restrictive of speech and innovation, technical innovation, which inevitably seems to happen with so many of these state initiatives, that they're more about uh, the politicians making political capital from attacking the big corporation than they are about actually protecting rights. So the attack on Section 230, I don't know how familiar you are with what's going on in that. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's, um, the platforms are a convenient scapegoat for problems that, uh, that they have simply made visible, right? Um, GDPR is actually kind of a good case because it globalized privacy protection. If it had just been uh, Germany or, or France saying, here's a whole bunch of new restricted privacy regulations uh, that they only apply here in our territory, uh, but they, <clears throat> because again of the leverage that they had uh, over the, the, the market size, uh, basically most of the world had to conform to that or is conforming to it in the process. So we're getting what we needed, which was global governance of uh, privacy and data protection. And uh, I think the, the privacy movement, the civil society actors had as much to do with that as, uh, as the states. Uh, because we, <clears throat> I can't go into the details here, but we've been struggling with uh, you know, various forms of data protection in the, in the ICANN context, and I know where all of the stakeholders stand in that regard, and uh, you literally have governments in, within GAC who are uh, opposing forms of data protection because of their law enforcement interests, uh, as opposed, and, and the data protection interests within these governments were subordinated to, to the law enforcement interests. So you, you don't, really know where the states are going to come down all the time, and you have to be realistic about the uh, sort of the public choice elements of, of that. That was a long-winded answer. No, actually, I appreciate you planting your flag on the commons answer, because usually in this space, if you guys are familiar, you get, it's a pseudo commons. It's an imperfect commons, right? I, I was just picking up off your last point, though. Secretary of State Clinton talks about cyberspace as a global networked commons, but also one where certain internet freedoms, kind of building off of FDR's four freedoms, 
we think should be sacrosanct. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how you see kind of the internet freedom a notion mapping on to kind of multi-stakeholder internet governance and what the legs, you know, for that idea is now at a time when we seem to be kind of disengaging from a lot of internet governance fora. Well, it's very unfortunate. The whole idea of internet freedom has come under attack uh, recently by people as uh, intelligent as Jack Goldsmith, yes, right? Um, and uh, there's uh, something by um, Karen Kornblatt. This came out from the Council on Foreign Relations, and they're basically saying, yeah, all this libertarian, uh, non-regulatory stuff is just passe, and we really need to uh, be more aggressive. Um, and again, I think that's the, the US version of alignment. We're, we're trying to assert American leadership, they call it. Uh, and um, that was one of the ambiguities and problems with uh, Hillary's um, Internet Freedom Initiative. That was perceived as an attack on the sovereignty of uh, other nations. And the State Department was a bit selective in who they funded, so that if you were like investigating Iran uh, or uh, some other American ally or American enemy, uh, you got lots of money. And if you were just more generally devoted and you were investigating it in, you know, in the US or problems of freedom of speech in other parts of the world that didn't, weren't part of the sort of the geopolitical alignment of the US, you, you didn't get any money. <laughs> so the, the, that kind of tainted the idea of internet freedom in, in ways and, and, and nationalized it in ways that were not productive. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of questions. I'm happy to stay here beyond no, six if, if, they, if you can. Okay. Discussion uh, afterward. You've had your hand for a while. Do you like to? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. So I love the idea, the comparison you're making, the you're making to the oceans and to space as uh, global resources that ought to be managed as economies, and that uh, society has decided collectively to manage as economies. There are things that are resources to manage as economies because of all the benefits get from doing so. Um, but what's interesting, and so maybe, maybe and I kind of agree with you that thinking of the internet that way or cyberspace that way makes a whole lot of sense for a variety of reasons. Um, but when you think about it, right, the ocean and space are managed as, governed as a commons, managed as a commons because of a consensus agreement reached by sovereigns. And so I'm wondering if the path that you're imagining involves a, may even be contingent upon a similar uh, consensus agreement among sovereigns to not assert their sovereignty and mm -hmm. recognize it. And if that's the case, do you think that's just next to impossible to imagine happening? In which case, how do you imagine the world you want to exist, and I want to exist, to exist? In the Paris Peace Pact for cyberspace. And even there, encroachment is happening in the oceans. Yes. No, it's a dish. Would you care to respond to that? Yeah, I think uh, th that's a very good point. Um, I think the difference uh, with the internet, uh, maybe the, the seas was like this also. Essentially, there was, uh, it was occupied by private actors first, and it was developed by private actors uh, under the nose of um, the governments before they knew it was happening. And then it became, uh, a, a global medium uh, before they knew how to control it. So we're in the reaction phase now and they're beginning to understand how to control it. Um, but uh, I think uh, we need the equivalent of uh, cyber maritime powers, <clears throat> uh, which is who fought for the freedom of the seas. It was you know the, the Dutch and then the British and so on. And the US was upholding that because they were a maritime power and they needed and wanted and understood the benefits of uh, and, and open commons in, the, in this resource space. So if we, I think if the US exerted that leadership, uh, again, hopefully not nationalizing the concept in the way that Hillary Clinton did, but, um, uh, and, and we got some allies, um, uh, I don't think that it's necessary for states to support the concept for us, for cyberspace to actually be a global commons, but I certainly think it would help uh, the encroachment process and the militarization process, especially the militarization process if, if states would just say, yeah, 
And uh, the space, you know, is an example of the kind of political constellation that had to happen. So we had, you know, a very easy coordination problem, right? The U.S. and the Soviet Union were basically the two powers with nuclear weapons. The U.S. was paranoid about uh, a sneaky nuclear attack, and the, the Russians knew that we had superiority. So it was kind of a easy, relatively easy compromise for them both to say, yeah, space is like open to all, and we can all fly over and watch each other, and, uh, and we can exploit it commercially. Uh, cyberspace right now is a lot more complicated. I totally agree. But um, if we don't uh, plant the flag, as, as he said, and, and, raise, and wave the flag, then uh, we're never going to get there for sure. So. Claim this land for cyber peace. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to round of applause for him. <laughs>